Hello, ladies and gentlemen, how are you doing? I hope that you guys are all having a very good day today. It's good to see all of you. Welcome to week two of SATAC. Today, you're getting treated to the 51st PVO slash KAIP 100 versus 343, aka 343rd, week two of SATAC, the first match of the day, unfortunately. Our first one for the day did get cancelled one of the teams pulled out so this is where you're getting started today i hope that you are all having a good day it's good to see you all here hello to maddie and the long mr no face guy easy nut butter and mr no face guy everyone else who's here at the moment thank you for the follows as well there is not much to do but to do it the first things first as we prepare for the matches to get started, we need to get our map sorted out. And with any luck, I should be able to show you doing it. So we have a dice roller here, and this will give us one of 18 numbers that corresponds specifically with the map that's being fought on today. So give it a second to get warmed up, and then we will figure out where we're going. Fourteen, which corresponds with Kamiman Bashel Al Assad versus King Hussein Air College. We are going to the Middle East. Number fourteen means early morning light clouds. So that'll be our weather for today and our map. Once we get everything set up, we can start working towards where the combat's going to be happening. So. How have you guys been doing? Did you enjoy week one of SATAC? Did you watch any of the VODs that you guys missed? Or did you catch up with anything later on? While I communicate with the team. Letting them know which map they're on today. And get everyone sorted into their distinct roles. <laughs> hey, Plasma1945, good to see you. You're impressed by the crazy AIM-9 loadout. So many AIM-9s in the last stream. TMC versus SPQR. <laughs> The Apache is out of place in this competition. Oh, no one's out of place in this competition. It's all about what you have to offer, and everyone has something to offer in aviation combat. And with a bit of luck, I might get to show off to you guys some of the new stream features that we've been working on. <laughs> but we'll give it a bit of time to get cooking. Aim 9, aim 90. I'll tell you what, those SPQR boys brought some... Uh, some very frustrating loadouts. I can, I can, uh, I can not necessarily encourage asymmetrical loadouts and fuel loads, but you know, there's a place for everyone. Oh, my mouth is stuck open. There we go. Looking much better now. Oh, I was getting way too excited. <laughs> okay. So I'm just having a look at some players gathering themselves up together. We've got some recognisable names. I'm excited to see what 343rd has to offer. And uh, once they've got themselves all organised, we can show you what's going off. Hey, ETF Breeze, good to see you. Good to see you. Ah, oh, I'm just cracking my neck while we get everything all set up and ready to go. While we're here, guys, and having a look at what's going on, Shall we take a quick look at the groups that are participating in this competition? We're currently in Group B with the 51st and 343rd going up against each other. Last week we had Group C with TMC and SPQR facing off. 
and we have more to look forward to. All of these teams that have decided to join into SATAC are providing us with excellent entertainment as they go up against each other. And it's important that we take a moment to recognize the sponsors for the competition, which include Heapler, Eagle Dynamics, Magnitude 3, Decker Ironworks, Razbam, TacView, and Lot ATC. <laughs> it's hard to sleep with a match the next day. Ooh, Breeze, who are you going up against? I should know this off the top of my head, but uh, I'll tell you what. Let's have a quick look. Ooh, RS versus GC. Hard fought. And in fact, we've got ETF versus Alamo at 1600 Zulu time. Following this match, with any luck, we'll raid you right into that to keep all of the combat going. <laughs> but yes, SATAC, one of the premier combat aviation competitions that has been going on for an extremely long period of time with pedigree that is incomparable. All right, looks like 343rd does not have access to Syria at this time. So we're going to re-roll between 1 to 12. Let me just get the dice roll set up and we'll redo it. All right, guys, let's have a look at the dice roll as it spins here. We have got to pick the map that everyone's got. And... Four. Four is Tbilisi versus Sukumi on a clear winter's day. There is not going to be a cloud in the sky. That is an exciting matchup. Winter and clear. We're going to have clear skies, which means that with our 51st boys, who undoubtedly are going to be bringing along their... <laughs> who are undoubtedly going to be bringing along their... um, bringing along their flankers... We might see them trying to get into the Caucasus Hills. Let me pass on the map choice. So we have Tbilisi versus Suk. Tbilisi versus Sukumi. Clear winter's day. Oh my goodness, I can barely contain my excitement. What a fantastic map to get stuck into. Now, I just have to make sure that as uh, everything refreshes here, my uh, attack view keeps up with it. And we've got the game loading in now. This is definitely an aeroplane. <laughs> yes, angry for a second because I accidentally pressed my number keys as I was typing in the buttons. Okay. How are we looking? Are we still live tracking everything? It looks like we are. Hey. You guys want to see something cool? Let's check that everything's all working. We have our battle screen looking good. I've decided to go back to the NATO icons because we have something that you guys will love. Live TACView telemetry. We can keep up with what's going on in TACView in real time. And also... We can have both views at the same time, which means that we can keep ourselves looking at DCS and TAC view simultaneously. All right. Now I'm going to keep myself hidden for this because there's going to be too much for you guys to look at with me on the screen as well. While we're getting all set up. It looks like everyone has decided on their starting positions already. I'm already recognizing some of the names that we have. I'm excited to see some of these guys fight. Especially on a winter map like this. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> oh, Lemon Wire, come on. You want to look at me? You'll get plenty of a chance. Don't you worry. So, we have the 51st 
PVO and the KIAP 100 versus the 343rd. <laughs> I mean, the names give it away. The 343rd is predominantly a Japanese organization, but has a number of different members and is going to be bringing a slew of different aircraft. However, the 51st PVO and the KIAP 100 are very much associated with your SU-27s, J-11s and SU-33s with gorgeous looking liveries to go with it. Hey Yambo, hey Smory, good to see you. And in fact, speaking of the 51st, in 2007, a few dedicated lock-on pilots decided the time was right to shape a true virtual Red Force squadron with new ideas, unique culture, and a competitive approach to establish worldwide recognition. On the 15th of December 2007, it was officially inaugurated as the 51st PVO Regiment to honour a real Soviet historical squadron that flew the venerable SU-27s and MiG-29 fighters out of Kremins Air Force Base. It's one of the oldest squads in DCS, with over a decade of complete domination in competition and community events. We'll tell you more about them as things start winding up. Oh, it's a real pleasure to have the 51st guys coming in here and joining in on the chat. And uh, I'm just having a quick look at the uh, the planes that we have sporting in at the moment. I'll show you soon. But it looks like we've got J-11s and SU-33s predominantly on the Red Force side with the 51st. And on the blue team with the 343rd, it looks like we have a JF-17, two F-16s, two F-18s and an F-14. It looks absolutely spectacular. Now, important notes to remember, this being the opening rounds of SATAC with the, uh, with this being the group stages, both teams still have access to E3 AWACS. However, once it gets into the knockout rounds, we will be losing this ability and they will have to be guided by player GCI. Oh my goodness, I was about to say. Iris, thank you very, very much for the subscription with Pyro, and 51st Yambo, thank you very, very much for the 10 gifted subs. <laughs> I hope you're not trying to buy some insider secrets. Don't you worry, though, we're going to have some absolutely killer coverage of what's going on out here, and uh, hopefully... My little old computer doesn't explode out from underneath me. I'm not saying that I'm going to allow myself to be bought and paid for. To be given favourable coverage to either team, but... It can't hurt. <laughs> Yambo, naughty, naughty. Ah, oh, look, if you got a sub from Yambo, please say thank you. Okie dokie. I'm just enamored with all of the cool tools they've given me to play with. In Soviet Union, the bribe is the key. True, true, true. We're getting close to the point where everyone's going to be getting ready to start up. So, if you're sitting impatiently in your chair, Have a good fight and hope you guys enjoy the show. Well, I hope you enjoy it likewise.
seeing as we have some downtime, it took out a Halo, Halo with the Waffen Trager. All right, well, we've got everyone starting up and showing us what we've got going around. Any bets on what's going to be happening? Do you guys know these teams? We've got some members of the 51st here, and I know some of the people in the 343rd. And they are all supremely good flyers. And I accidentally picked up whoops um just one sec Fifty first flies head on and fires Fox ones three forty three flies at ninety degrees and notches. It will be a perpendicular flight. Ah, I see, I see. There we go. I fixed what I just broke. I continue to impress myself. <laughs> Let's uh switch over to this screen, make sure everything's looking good and working as expected. You're excited to see fifty first choice of entry into the arena. You've seen some Seriously tight formations are passed. So seeing how they deploy into their game plan should be interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, they're showing up with absolutely gorgeous skins. Let's uh, get the sound of the jets roaring in our ears. Make sure our levels are all balanced out and everyone's sounding how they should. Here we have the SU-33s making their way over to the taxiway. ECM pods equipped. SU-33s differentiated by the, from the SU-27s by the additional canards on the front. Slightly more powerful engines with emergency afterburner mode. And an additional pylon for FOX-1 missiles. However, it looks like they might have foregone them in this instance. Now these are J-11s which have been painted in SU-27 colours to give access to FOX 3s should they be desired, and they have been. The limitations on the weapons that you can bring are up to four FOX 3 missiles. However, the SU-27s have access to the excellent R-27ER missile, so occasionally they decide to forego them. Looks like everyone so far has brought the ECM pods on the wingtips as well, and is looking good and capable. Over here on the <clears throat> over here on the 343rd side as we wait for the ground to load in. Now, important to remember that this is a Japanese squadron. And you can see with those bright red roundels. ACAS is spawning in with four A120Cs, three fuel tanks, two sparrows, and A9s on the wings. Starry Fox 9 is much the same. The F-16s curiously not bringing any external fuel, though sometimes once they get to the lineup point, they like to uh, just top up on fuel. Fox 3's in KIAP. Hey, look, sometimes you've got to play to win. We've got JF-17s here with their venerable SD-10 missiles. ETF number one. Well, they'll struggle to win in a... They'll struggle to win in a match they're not in. Looks like the F-14 is coming along, and it's bringing its full complement of AIM-54s. wonder if they are C models, and whether they've brought the Mark 60s or the Mark 47s. We'll have to wait until we've got one in the air so that we can have a look. A Tomcat! I know! I know! Look at it! Absolutely gorgeous, and I believe, according to the rules, uh, that if it is a Tomcat, that means that there must be a human Rio in the back seat. so let's see who we've got in the back seat of this here tomcat because we won't get the chance to see we have rossman in the front seat and the radar intercept officer is unamu suke yes the tomcat has brought four phoenixes 
It does uh, have to abide by the limitation of three Fox 3s, which means radar-guarded missiles. Okay. Everything's looking relatively smooth here. I have a lot of stuff open all at the same time, so uh, we'll just have to be a little bit tempered with how we use TACView and everything all at the same time, but I think it's looking good. Let's see how they drive the big bus together. <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? I cannot wait. So everyone looks like they're getting ready and lined up here at the moment. All of the 51st and 100. So on the reds, we have Stinger, Rich, Frosty, Technetinium, Zero Sum, and Black Pixel. And on the blue side, we have Rossman. Sunakukun 21, Starry Fox 9, very, very deadly pilot, Papa No, Udati, and ACAS. And they've lined up across two runways, getting themselves ready for combat. So, it's a bit hard to tell on this particular map. Uh, let's see if this is a bit easier to read. It's all kind of about the same. It's the trouble with this winter map, it can be tricky to see. But, as you can see, we have the outer circle which is the combat area the moment a team enters. It begins a five-minute timer. And if those five minutes pass without the enemy team being present in the circle, then it's a forfeit by default. With every five minutes that pass, the circle gets smaller and smaller in diameter, forcing the engagement. The teams have to enter and control the zone, either destroying each other or forcing the other team out. And upon reaching victory... They need to fly back to base and land. They need at least one plane to successfully make it back to base and land after victory is achieved. So, it's important not only to manage your weapons and win your fights, you have to keep enough fuel to make it home too. And it is a little opportunity for you to flex your pilotage ability, seeing whether or not you are capable of a buttery smooth landing. I remember that TMC showed off last week with a Cobra landing. I think we'll have to see if 151st will get their victory and secure it by a Cobra landing. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, go, go, go. And now it's time for the fight to begin. Both teams will be starting off as everything gets moving. Hopefully. Looks like the JF-17 is taking off first. Meanwhile, the SU-33s and SU-27s are rolling down the runway all at once. I wonder why the 343rd are letting the JF-17 go first, but we'll give it a, uh, a bit of time. Is it just me or is the stream a bit laggy? It may well be because I have TACU running at the same time. So if that ends up being a trouble, we will have to give it a bit of a break. But yes, the stream may be running a little bit rough. I apologize if that's the case. We've got everyone taking off here at the moment. Let's see how this looks. So, we have the tactical view of the entire operation over here. With 51st and 100 all taking off and making their way down in good formation. It looked like the JF-17 has an ECM pod. Perhaps they are confusing the 51st radars while having the Jeff well out front. You know what? I would say that that sounds very likely. And let's see how the rest of the boys over here are going. 
Definitely being spearheaded by the JF-17. It'll be curious to see what he gets up to. Then he's definitely climbing up at a rate of knots. So, we'll see how things progress. This is the combat area. Flanked on both sides by high mountains. With a large valley in the middle. For planes that accelerate well and perform nicely in amongst the mountains, particularly the Su-33s and Su-27s, with their excellent close combat dogfighting modes, they will be able to take good advantage of the mountainous areas. Meanwhile, the Blues, arguably in the vehicles that have better Fox 3 capability, will be strongly desiring to spend their time in the Central Valley, where that best range of their missiles is can be taken advantage of. Meanwhile, these guys are giving us a demonstration of the quality of flying that we can expect in this sort of round. What's the air temperature in this server? Let's see. Minus four. So, it's a winter's day and it ought to be popsicle temperatures out here. Which means that these jets should have all the thrusts they need. With some spectacular formation flying. We have the remainder of 343rd taking off and making their way up, up, up and up. Nice and cold, max performance down low. I'm sure that these boys must be well pleased with their choice of map winning that dice roll in a sense for the Sukhois. It's good to see everyone showing up. I hope that you guys are looking forward to the matches today. And of course, if you're noticing any technical difficulties, please let me know. I'll fix them as best I can, but if you are patient with me, then I will give you the best experience that you can. Meanwhile, absolutely gorgeous flying here from the 51st and 100s. I mean, it's still laggy. Golly, that's a bit unfortunate. Why can't you fly this well? Oh, a little bit of sledging. A little bit of sledging. In fact, I think I know exactly what might be causing this, but I don't know if I'm able to fix it. Uh, we'll give it a bit more oomph. And we'll go over here. And this should help recover things a little bit while I just refresh some of the connections. I'm aware that things might be stuttering just a little bit here. Alright, hopefully that gives it a little kick in the guts. This should definitely be interesting. Limit the FPS for TAC view for next streams. Is that something that I'm able to do um, just by restarting the program? Either way. If it all turns up a little bit pear-shaped, uh, then uh, we'll just stick to the in-game view. Now, at any moment now, we should be getting the alert that the 343rd have entered the circle, which will be a good cue from the boys at the 51st that it's time to get moving. And there we go. We have the warning. Blue have entered the battle area. And they're leading the way with Sunakuken in the JF-17 with the ECM pod. Acting like a great big noisemaker up there in the sky. Making sure that he's got everyone's attention. You can see the contrails of his friends up there in the sky behind them. Hiding behind that ECM emission. Meanwhile... It looks like 51st and 100 have realized that they need to get into the circle. So they've started to make their way over to the combat area. And oh my god, they are staying in formation in a turn. That's so cool. These guys are pros and they love this airframe. <laughs> well, formation in a sense. It does look good though. 
and they are splitting off into separate directions, to presumably to spread out and begin their attack. I doubt that either team has quite got sight of each other just yet on radar, but as things get closer and closer to the centre of the map, someone is going to pick up someone else. The battle area is contested, so that means that they both know they're inside the circle now. It is officially no mess around time. Here we have Papa No, joined by his wingman on the right flank, following behind the JF-17 with the ECM pod, hoping to have their radar signatures hidden. Check the 51st speed, they should be close to Mark II by now. Ooh, indicated airspeed of 500 knots. And let's see how things look on the TAC view. Yep, they are absolutely hauling ass at the moment. Splitting off into three distinct groups. Technectinium leading the first group, Rich leading the second, and Stinger leading the third. Meanwhile, still maintaining their coverage behind the JF-17 with the ECM pod, the remainder of the 330, 343rd, are following close formation with Starry Fox 9 leading the second group, the F-14B taking the higher altitude, and ACAS and Udati following up on the rear. So, let's keep an eye on how things are going. Things look a little bit smoother on my end, but keep me posted with how it looks. They've brought the F-14, I know, I know. And in fact, that F-14 radar can probably pick them up already at this range, so they ought to be getting good data. However, the 51st guys have all brought ECM pods, so whether or not the org can burn through that radar at, at that ECM at this range, uh, it will be interesting to see. Either way... Phoenixes are deadly at these high altitudes, but if you know what to look for, you can evade them. I reckon they'll be holding on to them until they get a little bit closer, even though... What ranges are we talking here at the moment? We are currently at a separation of 45 nautical miles, which is detection range for everyone, I think. They're getting involved. 20, 26 nautical miles for burn through. All right. So the ECM still banging away. I doubt that they quite know what altitude and distance these 51st boys are at, but they are absolutely hauling, 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 hauling. And we have our first missile out, an R-73 ER out from Rich, which has taken off from his plane. Looks like it's heading straight for Sunakuken. It's got the speed. It's got the range. Does he even know? Sunakukin looks like he's not going defensive too aggressively. Seems comfortable. However, this missile still has speed. Maybe not be quite so blasé about the dodge. We have a missile launched from Sunakukin. We'll just see whether or not this are... Oh my goodness. That's why you've got to dodge the first death. For the 143rd, we have R27 ERs launched from Technetigum and Stinger, and in return, Sunukukum's SD10 is flying towards Technetigum. We have a AIM-120C out towards Stinger. Has this SD10 got the range, and does it even have track? Nope, it's gone dumb. And what other missiles have we got going on in the air? That was a home on jam shot. Let's see how we are looking on the tack view here at the moment. We have the first of the Phoenixes out already, which looks like it's making its way in amongst the hostile forces. No losses thus far for the 51st, who are maintaining quite an altitude and separation dominance. Another AIM-54C going high, lofting deftly towards the 51st. So, let's get back to the battle and watch this happen live. It'll be interesting to see whether or not this... Phoenix can make the difference, but it looks like it's running out of speed 
and has no good track on anyone. We have an R27ER launched against Rossman, and in exchange, there is an AIM-54C going in that general direction too. Rossman will have to be careful here. These missiles can keep up with him, but they are flying away at a rate of knots. That missile has no energy left to follow them up. Meanwhile, we have a Phoenix with speed, but does it have track? It looks like the 51st have seen it, and they are going low. The Phoenixes are a big, chunky missile, which means they are quite susceptible to feeling the influence of drag. The other AIM-54 is completely out of speed, while an R-27ER launched towards ACAS with good speed is progressing towards the low altitude. Now we have two more R27ER launches and an R73 launch. This R27ER is going up against the F14, who needs to be a little bit more evasive than that. Have you got enough speed? And it's gone for the countermeasures. What about the ER against Papa? No. Doesn't have the speed to convert that into a kill. Let's check out the TAC view at the moment to get a better picture of the whole thing. We have a AIM-54C flying in formation with Stinger. Fortunately, dodged. Two more R-27ERs. Well, in fact, one of them's an ET. They'll have to be careful. It looks like Papa No might have had their luck run out, relying on countermeasures and no dice. Bad luck. However, we have an AIM-120C going up to meet Rich. Let's go see. Whether or not Rich has the legs to get away from it. Looks like he does. Has it got any kind of track at all? I don't think it's got any kind of track. Alright. Both Phoenixes are dead. Now, no losses for the 51st, but they are finding themselves to be encircled a little bit by the 343rd. R27ER traded with an AIM-120C in both directions. M120C doesn't look like it's got a good track on anyone. Actually, it may be following on to zero sum at a rate of knots, but he dodges just underneath it. Uh, there's the third, no, maybe the fourth Phoenix we have up in the air. Oh, that's going to be a difficult dodge. Oh, that was close. Unlucky for that to not connect. A very close range shot against Rich. This is going to be very difficult to dodge. And sure enough, connects. Starry Fox 9 gets a kill for the 343rd. The tables may be turning in the other direction. The only question is, is there still enough time to convert it for the 343rd? Now, the 51st boys are looking low. All these Phoenixes launched and yet no connections. We have an R27ET launched against Udati with a AIM-120C, rather, an R-27ET launched against Udati, and an AIM-120C in response, which looks like it may have good track on zero sum. Everyone is getting deadly close to each other right now. Have we got a kill on Technetikum? No, it's been dodged. We're going to move back to DCS right now with Starry Fox 9, who is deeply in the thick of it with an SU-27 right on his tail. R-73s are difficult to dodge at the best of times. You've got one coming in. Countermeasures? Countermeasures? No such luck. Oh, bad luck. And for Akas, what have we got going on here? Right in the thick of things with an SU-27 all amongst him. But it gets hit by his teammate. He's getting coverage. Who else have we got in the air? We've got an ET up against Rossman, which connects. We have one left. It is Akas for the 343rd. And... He is surrounded, surrounded by aircraft. And Red takes control of the battle area. That makes 51st the likely victors of this match if they can get home and land. Now, it got a little bit chaotic there at the end, so let's see if we can just catch up a little bit with some of the fighting that happened. We had Zero Sum, who went and merged against Rossman over here. This was the kill that we saw happen in the background. An R27ER launched against the F-14. He knows he's in serious trouble, dumping out all the chaff he's got. But an ER means extended range. Ooh, he spoofed the missile. 
and the ET comes in to follow it. Now, the ET is dangerous because it doesn't give a warning to your radar and it connects. Bad, bad luck. And the final missile that got ACAS at the end looks like it was an ER followed by an R-73. When you've got SU-27s on all sides, it's not a very easy thing to clear them all up. Starry Fox 9 managed to get right into the thick of the battle with the 51st and had an absolutely fearsome go of it, but unfortunately was discovered. Zero reached out too far. Low versus high fidelity combat. How do you mean? So that's a first round way. This A120C just looks like it came off the rails and didn't have anywhere to go. Even though there's plenty of targets all around the place to engage. And Starry Fox 9 launching another AIM-7 of all things. He's clearly used up all of his uh, AIM-120s. This one also has no track. Looks like Starry had all of the right ideas but none of the weapons to back it up. And ends up catching an R-73 for his trouble. Difficult to defeat at the best of times. So let's go see what the boys are doing. I reckon they're all safely looking forward to heading back home. All right. Now, we have a commentator who was intended to be a part of the competition for the other match that was going to be happening at this time. Unfortunately, the opposing team did pull out. So we'll see if Nuff Butter can help give us some insight on the match so far. Good day, mate. How you doing? I'm not too bad. Now everyone should be able to hear you properly. Fantastic. That was a f that was a very exciting match. I'm just absolutely uh, shocked at some of those dodges that didn't happen though. But uh, I, I I need to ask them. I mean, do you have any thoughts on why uh, why we saw some of the 51st pilots just sort of eat missiles? I'm not entirely sure. Um, What's more surprising to me is uh, so many Fox 3s launched from 343rd and uh, just none of them really going anywhere. Had Starry Fox 9 launch several missiles that just appeared to have no track whatsoever and the F-14 coming along, dumping all of its phoenixes and none of them really finding any tangible impact on the conflict at all. Yeah, no, I think I think some of what got the F-14 there was just uh, ineffective at low altitudes. When uh, when 51st got themselves down low, right, that heavy missile can't quite turn so well. But up high, it seems that 51st was able to sort of bring it into the notch, uh, defeat the missiles kinematically. And then I know just, uh, Rich showed off that fantastic inverted uh, split S they like to do as a great way to defeat missiles, especially Fox 3s, but making them track wide outside the maneuver and just bleed all their energy oh, yeah. and make them go wiggly and go stupid. Yeah, no, I I definitely noticed that. Uh, in fact, some of these M120Cs looked like they were glitching out with uh, with how much drama they were having managing to track some of these uh, these Sukhois, which definitely have, uh, have the ability to go pretty wiggly squiggly down low. But even still, it uh, it just felt as if 343rd was win in a winning position, especially considering they managed to get quite a powerful encirclement on all sides towards the 51st and converted that into nothing. Even though they were surrounded, the uh, Sikoi still felt like they uh, they were the ones doing the damage. Indeed, I think Starry Fox almost had a victory, and I'm wondering if that's why Rich ended up eating that AIM-120, thinking he was uh, going on the beam from a missile from the rest of the fight and that he could easily defeat it. And of course, we just watched it fly right into the center of his aircraft. I'm thinking maybe he had no idea Starry Fox was there. Starry Fox so low that the E3 was unable to pick him up and put him on the data link, which thinking about it again, these Sukhois don't have a data link, do they? Uh, they do. They do. But it's not, as, uh, it's not as comprehensive as the, uh, the data link within the... Um, within the Western aircraft. It's just a basic series of triangles that uh, that lets you see uh, 
where the location of hostile and friendly forces are, but it takes a little while to refresh, and it's not quite as comprehensive as uh, as the Western ones do. Interesting. And well, then maybe maybe that's what got Rich killed there, thinking he had defended a missile from the wrong target. But uh, it was it really did look like, as you said, that uh, three four three nearly came around and and encircled the Sukhois. You know, did lose a couple of their pilots doing it, but found themselves in a very strong position. And fifty first was able to fight their way out of it. Yeah, I'm just having a look at Rich's final moments here, and it definitely seems as if. Uh... No one knew that Starry was down there. I reckon that uh, he was picked up by uh, by Zero Sum pretty much by pure chance. I don't think anyone knew he was there. And uh, if he was loud... Because I know... I've known Starry Fox 9. I've flown against them before and got absolutely demolished. So uh, I know that they are a good enough pilot to absolutely massacre uh, the people if they get into the wrong situation. So I feel like um, if he had been left to... To, uh, yeah, to get away with it. In fact, you're exactly right. I don't think they had a clue that Starry was down there. And when that missile showed up and Rich started getting warnings about it, it was already too late. Yeah, in fact, indeed. Yambo is pointing out quite rightly that uh, I think that might be a, a blind spot for the SPO uh, radar warning receiver. Now, if you are conscious enough to attack an aircraft specifically from the blind spot of its radar warning receiver. <laughs> I think that demonstrates just the quality of pilot that we are interacting with here. But uh, these guys are some of the best. Indeed. Certainly I we saw 51st uh, enjoy showing off their formation flying skills at the start, but uh, I don't think either team here has got any slouches in them. Um, no. Perhaps no, not maybe at all. Fifty first just has a bit more, bit more experience working together, maybe, to get them up to this level of, uh, this level of skill. But I think that it's still a very even match between fifty first and four thirty third. Not only a very even match, but also demonstrates that there's no clear winners when it comes to the differences between eastern and western aircraft within DCS at the moment, especially with the limitations placed by SATAC. Uh, it feels like everyone's got a fighting chance, and one of the things that this competition has definitely taught me is the effectiveness of uh, the SU-27s, Fox 1s, the R-27ERs, which I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of people write off seeing as their, their uh, semi-active radar homing. Uh, they write them off a little bit as, as kind of being garbage missiles when you've got Fox 3s in the games, but I think it's been shown several times here that uh, they've got legs on them, and even if they need to be guided by the radar, if you know how to use it, they'll kill. They really do. I think a lot of that might come from people's experience fighting the uh, the DCS AI, you know, and that Fox ones are very easy to deal with there because, of course, once the Fox 3 goes active, the AI immediately turns away and loses track. But I would suspect that 51st is waiting a little bit longer to get their missiles in there, especially considering how high and fast they were with their initial missile launches that they could anticipate the return Fox 3s from 434th, and that's not 434th, it's 343rd. Uh, they could anticipate those Fox 3s, get their missiles in as close as possible before having to turn offensive, you know, going into their notches and really playing the game laterally as they move forward, running their ball down center, so to speak, uh, to get the most out of those extra range and you know, decent maneuverability missiles. ST Mori saying in chat that the R has great speed. If you launch it high and fast, it'll hit Mark 5.5 on the way, which I think actually is crossing the threshold of being considered hypersonic. That is a fast, fast missile. And no matter how much it. chaff and, and flare you dump into the air while you're going through it, uh, you'll struggle to get away from that. As we watch uh, 51st and 100th come back to their airfield, they just can't help themselves. They... They love the Sukhoi series of planes. You could just tell the way that they're sticking to each other like glue. Uh, they have chosen an airframe and they are absolutely demonstrating that they're some of the best people with it. Indeed, yeah. Those formation flights they've been holding are beautiful, especially with the fact that they've got turbulence on the server. So 
It's not just nice clean air they're flying through. They're having to use their actual skills as pilots to maintain these formations even more so than normal. Yes, and I must admit I have a soft spot being the Sugoi Sukoi myself. In fact, uh, <laughs> seeing, as, seeing as the match is, is going, can I... There we go. I'll make myself visible for just a little bit. Uh, yes. Now, one of the other things that the Sukhoi has, looking at the front of its nose here, and the Su-33 has it as well, is this electro-optical sight. In combination with the R-27 ETs, the electro-optical sight can be used to target uh, Box 2 missiles at quite long ranges without, uh, without providing any kind of warning for the recipient. And I think that they absolutely managed a coup by scoring a clear winter's day on this map. It couldn't suit them better. The electro-optical site is going to be contrasting perfectly against the cold environment. And you have no clouds in your way to disturb that kind of tracking. Do you reckon that's a big advantage that they have in their favor at the moment? You know, I would say so, but we didn't see... I mean, we saw, what, two or three ETs shot out, maybe, and not as many as their ERs. So even if it is an advantage they have, they don't seem to be using it as much. But when it does come down to using their ETs, especially when they're using them from up high, looking down like we saw them use a couple of times, I say without a doubt that that nice clear picture and the reduction of clutter is going to be working truly in their favor as they try to... Uh, get those those long range fox twos sort of in that range between ah, missiles you know on a radar missile it's a little bit too short but i don't want to use my my close in turn fight missiles so i think you're dead on that that is going to be a big benefit for them i uh i and last week i think we saw exactly the same thing i don't know if you caught the tmc versus spqr match but there were some j11s in there and they brought along their there are 27 ETs, and it's a tactic you see on every multiplayer server. Anyone who flies this plane will do it. They are they will launch an ER, and then immediately afterwards they'll launch an ET behind it, and you get all lights and sirens with the ER missile, and then they'll uh, have no hope of that missile connecting, but uh, they will count on the uh, the other pilot not necessarily knowing that there's an ET following it. And the F-14, I think, got caught by exactly that. Had an ER coming towards it, a FOX-1, and uh, it defeated that missile, and its RWR would have gone quiet, and there was an ET just behind it, and it came and cleaned it up right at the last second, and there were no flares or chaff or command measures going out. I don't think he had a clue that that missile was there. Uh, indeed, it's a... It's it's a common tactic, but you know, something done commonly, it might it might be a good one. You know, I think people found that they like that way to try and sneak the missile in there, especially knowing how much players in DCS rely on their RWRs to determine whether or not it's safe for them to turn back in. And in a situation like this where 343rd is already down two players, they're trying to be extra aggressive to make up for that loss. Uh, I would suspect that you know, the moment they could turn back in to be aggressive, they would try to do that. And maybe that is working against them a little bit as they, uh, as they, you know, found themselves running right into that ET. And even later in the match, we saw, um, uh, R 73s being followed, uh, quite quickly after to try and once again, you know, either guarantee that kill or get something hidden in there that they end up not trying to maneuver defeat. Uh, to get another kill for 51st, but uh, it wasn't needed as the first missile flew true right into the center of that remaining aircraft. No, you're exactly right. What do you think that 343rd needs to do differently in the next match to make sure that they uh, they get the connections they need? You know, I think the biggest thing they need is speed. Uh, it was pointed out quite early on that 51st was in Hot, you know, near 1.6 Mach, and uh, on the other hand, 343 was coming in around 0.8 Mach, and extra Mach really gets these missiles hard. Of course, everybody knows that traditional graph showing drag on an object related to Mach, and getting up to that Mach 1.0 point and beyond it really reduces the amount of drag on that initial burn of that motor, which can get a lot of extra range and energy into these missiles. And I think that might be why we saw their Fox 3s going a little bit stupid. 
They were a bit lower. They didn't have the altitude advantage, and they were quite a bit slower. So their missiles had to work extra hard to even get into the playing field with 51st. But in order to do that, it used up a lot of their energy. It means they didn't have quite as much to maneuver with 51st, which allowed them to sort of easily defeat a lot of their early launches. But I would need to see the, the TWS. I think maybe too much reliance on TWS here as well that uh, 51st was able to fly their tight formations and show up as one blip for a little while, possibly, especially if uh, 343rd wasn't expecting to see them so tight, uh, maybe confusing the radar uh, and the radar operator for the 14. So I, I would like to see a little bit more RWS to force the 51st guys to react to those missiles a bit earlier than they are now, because I think right now they're just playing that timing game, estimating distance to target, going, okay, we're within 30 miles, they probably launched, I've probably got, what, another 10, 15 seconds before I need to start worrying about their missile returning on me so I can keep guiding this in in my crank, and now I've got to go into the beam defensive, uh, but maybe trying to use some RWS to really confuse these guys into thinking that a missile is a lot closer than it is. No, I think you're exactly right. And with all three of the surviving members of 151st touching down, that means our first round goes to the Reds. They'll be switching sides and uh, going at it. In every match of SATAC that I have seen and commentated so far, there's one consistent theme throughout it all. The more aggressive team wins. And I think that 343rd lost the momentum a little bit and were playing a little bit reactionary compared to... Up we go. Uh, we're playing a little bit reactionary compared to their uh, their friends on the opposite team. And it did not necessarily pay off for them. So we'll see what happens in the next round to come. Indeed. I, I think maybe losing the Jeff early was what threw them off their game and allowed 51st to maintain that aggression and you know to jump back to the, some of the fights of last week we saw. The last time we saw these Russian jets out in the hands of TMC, their initial match, they seemed very passive, hanging out over their mountains towards the north of their arena, and which allowed the SPQR opponents, after a little bit of deciding, do we want to, do we not want to, to be aggressives, to be the ones to push into their field, and ended up resulting in the SPQR win, of course, for that match. And once again, we saw the same thing here. It seems aggressive uh, behavior, you know, tempered aggression, but aggressive behavior nonetheless is what wins these matches. And uh, being able to react dynamically to your plans being thrown off, you know, losing that first aircraft early, hoping that maybe they could get the jammer to do a little bit more for them and finding it to be lost quite at the start might have thrown uh, 343 completely off their game. So it would be interesting to see what they'd change up now to respond to that change and that loss early. Maybe they're going to be flying as a formation, or maybe they're going to try the same thing again and hope it works this time. I, I, I'd i like to see a change up personally, but what do you think? I must admit, in fact, until you said it, I had completely forgotten that there was a Jeff in this match. Uh, <laughs> it, it got bushwhacked so early on in the conflict that uh, that I almost I got lost in the excitement, and I think I forgot that it was there at all. So, um, yeah, no, definitely whatever they were doing with the Jeff there uh, did not convert into into any kind of value for them, and it was just lost. It just kind of disappeared for them. So uh, I think they'll definitely want to play things a little bit different. I think, uh, I think that in terms of ECM, uh, there is no denying the fact that the 51st has the advantage with every single one of their planes coming along with ECM. Whereas the uh, the 343rd were kind of just hiding behind the one plane and relying on that to do all of the work, and it just it didn't fool anyone. Uh, it it was from the get go. They knew what they were doing. There was no surprise for the uh, for the 51st. So I think playing it differently is going to be the case. And the best performances I've seen from the Jeff in the competition so far are just by punching it to max altitude and using those really good quality SD-10s to uh, do a little bit of long-range work for you. Indeed. Now, we only saw one or two SD-10 launches before it got schwacked and don't even know if they ended up tracking on anything before. Uh, uh, they um, they hadn't even entered Pitbull by the time that... Uh, yeah. 
by the time that that Jeff ended up to be uh, ended up to be memories. Poor old Sunakukan had no luck. They let that Jeff get too far out in front because you remember at the well, start they sent the Jeff off first and then waited on the airfield to give uh, you know some intentional spacing. But I think that might have ended up hurting them as the Jeff was sort of out there with no backup. Yeah, no, I agree completely. It felt weird that they left the Jeff so far ahead and it just kind of felt like it was being hung out to dry as opposed to there being a cogent plan towards its use being formed somewhere in the background. But who knows? Maybe uh, maybe their plan with a little bit of modification will work perfectly. Indeed, I think seeing the Jeff uh, armed out with the exact same payload as last time might be the one to watch at the early set see if something changes, see how they try to react to 51st's ability to deal with the Jeff so quickly. And, uh, you know, hopefully hopefully employ it in a better method and keep it as a uh, quite a dangerous foe for 51st here. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I agree completely. The, uh, the Jeff and the F-14 will be the two airframes that will need to demonstrate value here. And they will need to do it quite a... Uh, Quite enthusiastically, I think, the F-18s and the F-16s are holding their own. I mean, jack-of-all-trades aircraft that are never a bad idea to bring along. Uh, so if you're going to be bringing along some oddballs like the uh, like the JF-17s and the F-14s, you have to really explain that you've uh, you've got some kind of cogent plan behind it. Yeah, you have to you have to do what the fifty first has done. They've definitely brought the uh, the underdog aircraft in many people's eyes, but they've clearly put in the time to make sure that they are masters of it. And uh, the you know that Tomcat, I think maybe was a little bit too low in altitude. It, it seemed like while it did get a bit of an altitude advantage over some of its teammates, it was uh, never that high. Uh, not really in the range that that aircraft gets to uh, call all of the shots and sort of be the uh, yeah the master no of the definitely. If if you're if you're bringing a Tomcat and it feels like the enemy team is bullying you at high altitude, then you, there's something up with your Tomcat or high enough altitude. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully, we see a change here. I'm I am interested to see how Fort Three Forty Third changes up their tactics to deal with that first match, and I'm I'm expecting to see a, a significant change. Uh, at least to their altitude and maybe even their airspeed. But uh, what about you? No, I agree completely. And this is not to say that their performance was anything less than incredible. They flew really I well. Have wiped the floor um, with me. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't have stood a chance. They flew really well. It it just felt like the tactic was wrong. And with a little mm. bit of fine tuning, I think that there was windows of opportunity for all of those Sukhoi aircraft to be turned into smoking craters throughout the Georgian mountains. And some of them did. We saw exactly what they needed to take advantage of, which is firing those missiles into those great big planes when they stray a little bit too high and they don't have quite enough situational awareness. And uh, yeah. all it takes is a few seconds. You know, I'm thinking about this more and more, and I'm wondering if they're trying to attempt... You know, with the mud hen on the corner, I've been hearing a lot of talk about how the F-15E is going to be used in some of these PvP conflicts. And one thing I've heard multiple times, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, is the use of the Wizzo as a sort of infield shot caller. Somebody mm. who's focusing almost exclusively on their situational awareness page and telling people what to do. And I'm starting to wonder if they might have used the Rio in the F-14 in a bit of a similar manner. Uh, and that was how they were able to get Starry Fox to get around the fight so well, because you did see fantastic positioning at a 343rd. And, of course, having, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first appearance of a multi-crew aircraft this year, or was there one last week? And I I don't think it. there was one last week. I think I think this was the first appearance of the multi-role air or the multi-crew aircraft. I wonder if they're making uh, use of the fact that, of course, the 14 gets its own data link and trying to use that to employ players in their best position. And if, if 343rd, this flight around, gets another fantastic position where they boxed in 51st, I would almost say that that's a guarantee that that might have been what they were doing. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And and truth be told, I 
I'm not uh, enough of an expert to say. Oh, neither am I. If we were, we'd be flying rather than commenting, wouldn't we? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Those, uh, those who can do and those who can't teach. Indeed. All right, I think we've got everyone queuing up here at the moment, and uh, I might start covering this battle. I will catch you again once this one's over. Fantastic. I Thank you very much. A good fight. Some wonderful insights provided there by Nuff Butter, who uh, unfortunately the match that he was going to be commentating today was put on the back burner with one of the teams pulling out. I'm aware that the uh, I'm aware that the stream is a little bit laggy, and uh, I am doing everything I can in the in the foreground to try and fix that. Um, I'm sorry for the strange performance. I'm doing my best here. Unfortunately, my computer is made out of wood. The game is performing just fine. The only problem is that uh, that something about the conversion into the stream is uh, is unfortunately not communicating quite the way I want it to. It's not unwatchable. Well. If it's not unwatchable, then that's as good as we can hope for at the moment. Wood computer, that's a fire hazard. I know, I know. So if you ever see the stream briefly go go like this, it's me just trying to recapture everything and make sure that the view is looking okay. Probably not assisted by the fact that I'm attempting to do this, which is have uh, tack view and DCS open at the same time, which is probably causing my computer to burst into flames. So... With any luck, we will uh, survive this encounter. And uh, we will continue to find good solutions as things go on. So. We have the boys over there for the 51st. Looking good, feeling good, and 343rd are uh, getting queued up and ready to go. Do you have a display capture and a game capture in the same scene in OBS? Let me see. Uh, no, I don't. Anyway, let's go through what we've got. So... We have similar loadouts for all of the 51st boys, but for the 343rd, we have a F-16 with four AIM-120Cs. We have the F-14 with AIM-54s four times, two Sparrows and two AIM-9s. Three fuel tanks on the F-16 with four AIM-120Cs and two AIM-9Ms. Four AIM-120Cs, three fuel tanks, two Sparrows and two AIM-9Ms. Likewise on the other F-14, uh, F-18s, the classic loadout for the F-14. I mean, yes, it's, it's, it's made for it. This will be the one to watch with the, uh, with JF-17 Thunder. And uh, we'll see if they can make some better use of this airframe as they chug along. There is no denying that it's a cool airplane. <laughs> Okie dokie. What are we looking at here? In fact, just let me check something here. Which one of my... So my CPU is fine. Oh my goodness. One of my GPUs is at 100%. One of them is at zero. What if I tried to do... This. 
With any luck, that might fix it. 343rd. Well, looks like we have some tech difficulties happening in the background here. I have a strange feeling that the server might be uh, might be having a bit of a hiccup. GPU court slacking, you're not wrong. Hopefully that actually fixes it. Um, let me see. But yes, it looks like we have a little bit of technical hiccup happening here in the background. So we'll give it a second to figure itself out. But the GPU's definitely been caught lacking, that's for sure. We've got everyone up on the starting line, but unfortunately we've lost some of the boys. So we'll have to give them a second. Just to get themselves worked up again. This is live, Borchy848. Just as if proof were needed. I'll say you, say your name out loud. Uh, yes, this is as live as it gets. This is currently ongoing. You ordered a Big Mac and it's been one hour. You could have ran and gone get it. Live, live crowd, live crowd. The frustrating thing is that DCS is running perfectly on my end. It is SATAC 2022. It's because they had to postpone the event a little bit. So this is... Satax 2022. Pre-recorded technical difficulties, I know. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. Well, that doesn't bode well. Oh, oh, fuck. Alright, something is clearly going a bit pear-shaped here. Yes, 51st, uh, usually lags most on the ground, yes it does. But also, the game's not lagging, it's, uh, it's unfortunately, it's my stream. Something about OBS in the background is having a bit of a tough time with it. Um... Which is just no good. But you're right, it does seem a little bit smoother if I'm a bit zoomed out. So, goodness knows what's, uh, what's causing all that. And the GPU's not doing its job, I know. In fact, my uh, GPU number one, which is the one that should be doing the encoding here, uh, is currently reporting 0% usage. And GPU number... Two is reporting 100% usage, so goodness knows why it's decided to do that. We'll get to a point here where these boys need to, uh, yeah, GPU one is on its u its union mandated coffee break, which is fair enough. We love a union here. Well, 
we're not careful, we'll run into a situation where everyone needs to refill. But it wouldn't be DCS with a little bit of scuff. Big buggers look haunted sometimes, that's for sure. Ah, oh, look. We love the quirks. We love the quirks. Have you done something weird between this stream and the last one? No, that's the weirdest part, is that I haven't. I have not. Though that might have smoothed it up a little bit, in which case that explains what's wrong. Uh, it appears to have had been tack view. How do I limit the FPS in tack view? I know I shouldn't ask you this now, but we'll see how it goes. You see, now that I've closed tack view, that seems to be working much better. Look at that beautiful bubble canopy. I always liked the yellow tint. Always had a good look about it. But yes, the JSDF skins. It's hard not to love them. Such a pleasing colour palette. What more could you want? Okay. The, the tension in the air must just be palpable for, for these guys. I mean, worse enough that you have to do some competitive streaming. Uh, but at the same time, you have to do it in front of a whole bunch of people. And uh, use the GPU control panel. And yeah, I know. Uh, in fact, that's not a bad idea. NVIDIA control panel. See if I can do this without bricking my PC. And manage 3D settings. We'll go here. It's tack view. And vertical sync on. Now, the real question is, how do I set the frame rate? Background application max frame rate on. And we'll set that to 20 FPS. We'll get this to use this one. Goodness knows if that'll work, but it might. And it looks like the connection issues are persisting. So we might have to be patient for a little bit here. It does look like it's running a little bit better just from uh, my monitor here. So maybe there's a there's a little bit of a a little bit of luck happening our way. So how are you guys going anyway? Now, I'm sorry I don't have the time to read out everyone's uh, followings and, and musings and, uh, and all that sort of thing. 
Uh, it looks like we might be switching servers. So, we're going to be switching onto the backup server. No worries. Good morning to you, Dreadnought Leather. It's good to see you. It is good to see you. I hope that you're having a good day and enjoying yourselves very much. I might just turn down some settings here and see if we can get things to run a little bit better. Perfect. And I'll give the game a quick restart. The sky is dangerous. Be safe. Oh, look. I'll do my best. It's not as dangerous as leatherworking, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, what am I looking for here? Switch on the music for a little bit while we're waiting for things to get moving. Knives and stuff. It's a dangerous game, that's for sure. But yes, if you guys do enjoy my content, please. There are a number of places that you can catch airshow content not limited to joining in on my Discord and following me on Twitter. Two good places to get all of your airshow, the talking plane, in high density airshow action, innuendo intentional we're getting everything loaded back up here while i get real-time telemetry connected up for the second server Perfect. Looks like that's all working. And DCS is running. Perfect. So a few connection problems for the 343rd, which unfortunately slowed things down a little bit, but at least we have a backup server kindly provided, which means that we can get ourselves right into the action quick, fast. No dramas at all. Hopefully we can get all the boys working in perfect harmony again. And I have my tack view connected. And everyone is spawning and starting up. This also gives everyone a good opportunity to refuel and get themselves nice and fresh and happy looking. Oh, Beatrice is sitting with you. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. I'll switch screens. I turned down the graphics a little bit just in case uh, we can eke out a little bit more performance out of the whole thing. So it might look a little bit shit, but that's okay. Better that it is speedy and smooth. That does look a lot better, doesn't it? A fast backup must be an EBR. No kidding. Maybe if this whole competition goes well enough, I'll start up a charity fund. They're helping me buy a computer that's uh, from a recent memory. We get up close and personal with the 51st boys, only Satak gives you this kind of face-to-face -face time with some of the finest pilots in the DCS competitive scene.
some fine pilots and there are 10, maybe 12 polygons of detail. What's good there's not 14 polygons. If there were 14 polygons, you might hear in the new sentient airplane killed in PC explosion. As the GTX 1080s that he literally found in a bin. And that's not a lie. The 1080s that are in my computer right now, of which there's two, I found in a bin. Uh, yes, uh, they will explode into deadly shrapnel and kill me instantly. Who's flying for 51st? Well, ask and you shall be told. Let's go see who we have for the 51st. We have... Technitinium, Zero Sum, Black Pixel, Frosty, Stinger, and Rich. Yeah, 1080BI, Bin Edition. The 343rd, we have Rossman, Papa No, Starry Fox 9, Suni Kukin, Udati and VIP Boy. In our F14, we have Rossman, and in the back seat for him, we have Unamu Suke. No doubt they're all looking good and feeling good. It would be difficult to not be having a good time in a plane like that. So. Once again, it looks like the uh, 343rd. Uh, Splitting their takeoff with the F-14, taking the lead with the F-16, F-18 and the JF-17 coming in from behind. They split their takeoff like this in the first one, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not they wait as long as they did last time to get everyone up in the air because the JF-17 in the first round took off much earlier than his comrades, entered the zone before anyone else and was promptly killed. If I were to guess, just by going off the way that this is looking, I would say that they might be intending to lead the way with the F-14 and get as much information as they can while the force behind them comes along with intent to kill. Looking good, feeling good. And how are... The boys for the 51st looking with their SU-33s heading along to the runway. Welcome in, Susumu. You are ready to watch the start of SATAC Week 2, Round 2, 51st PVO versus 343rd. Feels like we're missing one. Where's the, uh... Oh, two of the, of course. The J-11s are taking off from the second runway.
That's not a runway. Look at the big act. Oh, gosh. That's where the treasure is buried. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. All right. It's time for me to tell them to go. That's the most funnerest bit of the whole thing. As these boys get schmoovin' down the runway in their gorgeous SU-33s. Thank you once again, everyone, for all of the follows today. It's a real pleasure to be putting on this show for you all, and I hope that you're enjoying yourselves very much. Particular thank you to all of you who have been patient with the technical difficulties on all ends. It's DCS. How can we expect anything less than a little bit of scuff? But that's part of what makes it fun. And it looks like the SU-33s of the 51st are taking off happily down the runway, followed closely by their J-11 mates. Who... Oh. A little bit rough, buddy. Careful, careful. Zero Sum cutting his burner potentially a little bit too enthusiastically. Formation takeoff looking good. Oh, look, we'll have to keep a close eye on the uh, on the boys. Meanwhile, as expected, the F-14 is leading the way for 343rd. So I reckon they'll be planning to use this as a pseudo AWACS as they enter the area. Meanwhile, the second flight of pilots is taking off to follow. And shortly behind them, we should be seeing the last group get moving. So, different tactics from last time. They're not leading the way with the JF-17. Instead, letting the F-14 Bravo take the front seat. <laughs> The F-14's taking off. I know people who would rip your guts out for saying something like that. The F-14's not old. But they're definitely taking to the skies. Not burning up to altitude, just uh, staying in mill power for now. So no real rush to get things going. Meanwhile, proof if proof were needed, the 51st putting on a show. As pointed out earlier, this server does have turbulence turned on, so flying in for close formation like this is no easy task. This is not buttery smooth air that they're flying through. These guys are sticking together like glue, and they're managing to do it in some fairly hostile air. What an inspiration. These guys know their airframes, and they are showing us. First round went to them, deservedly, they flew well. But it will be interesting to see whether or not uh, 343rd can cope with the Russian aggression that we have on display here from the boys. I know I'm named Airshow, but it looks like the Airshow is being left to someone else today. These guys are flying like a dream. Rock steady. And that F-14 out there, who's probably picking these guys up on radar, well, maybe not. 
the important thing to remember is that these guys all have their ECM pods on. So looking at this group of people, I doubt you'd be able to differentiate how many aircraft there are in this formation at all. The SU-33s are taking the higher altitude position. They're keeping their burners on while they climb higher, while the J-11s are staying on the low road a little bit, but catching up and still climbing to altitude. Meanwhile, we have the F-14 Bravo at 30,000 feet, looking like he's about ready to enter the danger zone. Now let's check that tack is all working and looking good. And it is. So, uh, who have we got and where? We have Rossman leading the way at 0.9 Mach. And over here, we have 343rd, all hovering around the 1.2, 1.3 mark rate. Absolutely going clapping speed. The interesting thing will be to see whether or not the F-14 can pass along the information that these guys are flanking around the northern route. Which is a question that may be self-answering. They'll know that these guys have to enter soon. And seeing as they've just entered the battle area, these guys will say to each other, it's time for us to enter the circle and make sure that we don't lose just by being absent here. <laughs> so they'll start their turn in. And as expected, they do it in beautiful formation. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is just showing off. Come on. This is just showing off. I mean, I've got a massive smile on my face. It's not meant to look this easy. That is wicked cool. Unbelievable. Could watch this all day. Don't need them to fight. One more, one more, one more. Perfect. Oh, what more could you want? So, they're at 30,000 feet and heading towards the circle. Still sticking together in quite close formation. Two distinct groups, the SU-33 sticking together and the J-11 sticking together quite closely. Meanwhile, the F-14B is leading the strike group right down the middle, hoping to take advantage of the inner valley of this terrain in order to get the best missile shots that they can. Distances between the two are still quite long, but there is a massive speed and height advantage for 51st at the moment. It just all depends on what they're going to use to take advantage of it. Meanwhile, we have Starry Fox 9 and Papa No sticking together. They will form the first group for the combat area. Staying in combat formation, these guys have got each other covered. And they're keeping a hold of their fuel until they commit exactly to what kind of fighting they plan on doing. The J-11s are about to cross into the combat area at around about 37 down feet. Meanwhile, the top group of the SU-33s have progressed up to 41,000 feet and are still climbing. Oh, geez, I was on the wrong screen. And they are 42,000 feet at the moment and still climbing. They have all entered the zone. The current separation between the two groups is 72 nautical miles. Definitely far enough for the F-14 to start building a picture of things, though whether or not they've managed to cut through their ECM just yet, I'm not sure but I think they'll know that they're at high altitude. So, a little bit of reactionary flying happening here, trying to get themselves at a higher altitude to keep up with the boys coming in on the right-hand side in three distinct groups. I mean, tactically speaking, it's like a dream come true. Common air show dummy moment. Oh, come on. I'm not being ridiculous.
So, everyone's separating out here at the moment. In fact, all three of them are separating out into their pairs, which are then separating, separating out even further. All going incredibly fast. Meanwhile, the 343rd are dropping their first sets of fuel tanks and progressing towards it. With these guys spreading out so widely, it remains to be seen what exactly their plan is. And we have Rich here, who as at 57,000 feet, launching an R27 ER, that has the really has the possibility of reaching out and touching them. That is a incredibly long range shot, but you have the altitude to take advantage of it. I can only imagine that, uh, and there's a second R27 ER shot from Stinger. Meanwhile, Rossman launches a Phoenix in response. Question is, do they have the range? There's three R27 ERs heading towards Rossman now. These guys are not here to mess around. I think you're going to have to get tactical. Is this going to be a repeat of what happened to their JF-17 in the first round? A phenomenally long-range shot that did connect. You have to defend more aggressively when you have missiles of this speed coming towards you. And it looks like the F-14 has managed to spoof the first one. Second one has also gone dumb. And the third one has no track. Looks good. Meanwhile, the Phoenix is still in the air. What kind of speed are we talking? I don't think this has the energy to really push towards anyone. I think that has definitely seen its last legs. Meanwhile, we have AIM-120Cs and SD-10s being launched. Quite ambitiously, I might add. I don't think that has the legs to catch up with anyone. SD-10 as well is progressing towards the target. We'll have to see where these are getting to. I don't think there's any kind of particularly powerful track. We have a, another AIM-120C launch from Starry Fox 9 as an R27ER is coming down towards him. Now, can he evade that shot? So, we'll have to check and see whether or not that's got a decent enough track to keep up with him. I doubt it. In fact, I think that that's been spoofed. Meanwhile, the AIM-120C that was launched before, not too much speed on it. And I'd say that that thing has probably gone dumb. SD-10s not connecting just yet. In fact, they've all ran out of energy. Another SD-10 coming out from the JF-17 at 16,000 feet probably does not have all the energy it needs to connect. Hehehe. <laughs> We'll make an only turbo fans for you guys. These guys are flying through a wall of AIM-120Cs and SD-10s, all of which have not enough energy to turn anything into kills. So we have a bit of separation and a moment of pause as everyone is gathering their thoughts. It definitely looks like we have... Oh, and here we have the dreaded... R27ER followed by R27ET shot. And they definitely know that something's coming towards them. Question is, does the ET have track? And I would say that I don't think it does. I don't think anything's getting tracked there. These missiles just swinging for the fences and not really connecting with anything. A120C in the air, but no speed on that and no track. No deaths just yet. We have an SD-10 coming out at from 5,000 feet from Sunakukum. It may have the legs to reach out and touch someone over here. Meanwhile, we have Black Pixel at 40,000 feet. Massive altitude advantage with the missiles to take advantage of it. He's launched an R-27ER against one of these downward targets. It is going to be virtually impossible for them to escape. All they can do now is put their hopes and prayers into countermeasures. They will be getting warnings. The question is, can they lose it in the ground cutter? And I think they have successfully spoofed this one. It's going to miss him by inches. 
And bad luck not quite connecting on that one. Meanwhile, there's a Phoenix coming up to Black Pixel. Has flying this high proven to be his undoing? I think it's going straight past him, though. No dice. All right. We have an ET going out. Once again, seeing how lucky Sunakukum is feeling. Has it got track? It does. Sunakukum goes down. Bad luck. We have AIM-120Cs in the air coming up towards someone. Yeah. Oh, not enough speed, but it's damn close. We have another Phoenix in the air. Who's it going for? Ooh, this is a deadly, deadly dangerous shot. Pull some shapes. Ooh, that is going to miss by inches, I think. Yeah, that is a deadly close shot. Meanwhile, he has another AIM-120C coming to deal with him. No dice just yet. I think uh, I might have missed someone else getting lost there. We have an R27ER going against the plane that has just launched an AIM-120C against him. You have to get more tactical. Can you notch it? Oh, that was dangerously close. Ooh, you can't even claim that that was anything other than luck. We have an ET launch, but I don't know who that's tracking. We just had someone explode out in the front. An AIM-120C going against Techneticum. We're going to have to go through the TAC view to closely see what we're missing here because there is so much happening in such a short period of time. The F-14's gone. I don't know where it went. And we have an ER launch against Vip Boy, but it's all gone wrong. We have missiles in the air coming from all directions. He can physically see all of the different aircraft that we have coming flying through the air here, including one directly above him. Just pick a direction and go. He launches name nine against the SU that's above him, but no dice. One of his buddy catches him. Where's that? Aim 9 going. It doesn't look like it has the legs. And the last one falls. Golly, we're going to have to go straight to TAC view and figure out what the hell happened there. So, who did we have there at last moment? We had Vip Boy, who was defending against all kinds of trouble surrounding him. He moved up to launch an Aim 9, but earned himself an R27ER, two missiles from two separate directions. Udati was defending hard against all kinds of trouble, but had no luck. Let's see what happened to the F-14, because there was so much fighting happening. So, Rossman in his F-14, going low and defending hard against all kinds of missiles being launched. Now, 27 ER, not necessarily going against him. Meanwhile, Stinger has got AIM-120Cs following him everywhere. Rossman is just down here pulling shapes, not entirely sure. How you're going to defend against that? What have you got in the air? Zero sum. Zero sum comes down here, defending hard against a missile from Udati, but just cannot evade. Rossman is dropping everything he's got. But what is it specifically that gets him? Where do you get this video thing that shows what happened? One of the sponsors for this match is TacView, and this is a program called TacView. It's an R27ER that is... How does Rich get this massive off ball site shot? Right on the edge of the gimbal limits of the radar, and he launches that ER. I'm amazed that that radar kept track. That is an ambitious shot, but that shows how deadly a Fox 1 can be. Let's go check on Nuff Butter and see how things are going. G'day, champion. G'day. Oh, I just had that to catch... a much more exciting fight. Yeah, that was, that was brutal. I had, I had to go back to the tech view because so many people died in such a short period of time, I didn't know what happened. It was in... Incredible how quickly people die. There are some really close moments there. Unfortunately, Starry Fox trying to come in from the side and do something and eats a return shot from Tekken early. I was almost sad, if I was to say anything, that that first AIM-54 off of the Tomcat didn't connect with Black Pixel when he was up there because it had so much energy. Like, almost 
two, maybe even three times the amount of energy that Black Pixel had. He was a little bit slow up there, high engine struggling, and that uh, Phoenix was right where it wanted to be. And if it had track, I think that would have been uh, the first loss for 51st. But unfortunately, they lost it. That second missile got close, as you said. Man, that was just, oh. I could feel it watching. I was cheering for the missile. I feel bad for cheering against the player, but I wanted to see it connect. They were such underdog shots as uh, 434 found themselves so low on the deck, and 51st was able to maintain you know, quite a decent altitude advantage of well, 40,000 feet. pretty high. That's massively high. Once I, I saw that, um, that not only was 343 in the valley, not in amongst the mountains, and they were they, they had planes above them at 40,000 feet. I mean, at that point, all you can do is drop chaff and hope that the missiles get lost in the ground clutter. Um, and in fact, it's funny that the, the, the missiles that got Starry Fox 9 was that R27ER-ET combo, and in fact, Starry managed to defeat the ET, uh, but got clapped by the, uh, the ER themselves, which is just a bad stroke of bad luck. But that Indeed. is what it is. I was also, you know, I'll tell you something that I was interested in seeing as the initial deployment from 51st immediately deciding to break their, you know, tight formations uh, once they got in the circle and go into a left-hand deploy. I was wondering if we'd see something that I've known of a couple of the 51st guys, Rich in particular, to be working on kind of being called a daisy chain where it, it's sort of a modern application of the thatch weave almost where... You have one set of fighters out front firing missiles, and the moment that they're turning into the crank and then into the beam, you've got your next wave of aircraft already up in support. And they didn't end up doing that, but it was interesting to see them get out far, out fast, and get those first shots on. You know, it's not rare that a Tomcat isn't the first one uh, to launch missiles with the absolutely insane range of those AIM-54s, but it looks like 51st was able to sort of throw a wrench in that book by getting their ERs out from what must have been 40, 50 miles. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And in fact, I was hoping that I could pull someone from, uh, I was hoping I could pull someone from 343rd to interview. Um, but it looks like I might have missed my chance with that one. Though if there are any members of uh, 343rd in the chat at the moment, please let me know, and uh, we can we can banter for a quick moment because I'd love to hear about. Even though you guys didn't come out on top this time, uh, it was a phenomenal showdown. Uh, now we have uh, we have the fifty first just showing off their formation flying abilities. I mean, that <laughs> those formations were were just phenomenal. The highlight of the show for you, particularly. Yeah, I mean, you could just watch it all day. Indeed. Uh, it, was, it was impressive to see, you know, something that might might be telling with the ability to maintain these formations. You know, they've clearly spent a lot of time flying with one another, and there was almost always mutual support happening on 51st side, but that's not to say that 343rd didn't have their own uh, really well-executed mutual support. There was almost always somebody coming in active when people were going cold. It just, I think it just came down to the altitude. Uh, disadvantage that you, you really can't recover from in those early ER shots forcing them down low might have been what uh, what played this out for 51st's favor. Yeah, no, I get you, absolutely. Uh, that was that was just great work, great work. Uh, sorry, you'll just have to keep speaking for a minute while I just check a handful of things. Indeed, I can speak away oh, there were a couple other moments that i'd love to love to rebring attention to even if we can't take a look at them uh just yet um the first obviously you know we watched rich have that amazing off borshite so, borshite borsite shot in it, uh that ended up taking out the f-14 but it's it's worth pointing out that that's a follow-up shot that had to have been well executed and well uh well verbalized as that's coming off of Stinger's ER that he fires out uh, on that F-14. Rich is already there to back up uh, that shot when it gets trashed in a bit of a cross block, which is something that, you know, I think we started to see here as the 
51st ended up getting the better positioning, having a bit of a wider spread. Not quite that beautiful boxing in that Starry was able to pull out of the first match, but something definitely up there in terms of getting the wider positioning on 343rd. And that was really the benefit of it there was that when they needed a push from one side, which would, of course, get return fire as Stinger found, uh, I think, two, maybe three AIM 120Cs chasing them out of the fight in there. Rich was already there to back it up with his own missiles, uh, you know, which is something that certainly is uh, towards the winning team. Uh, you know, keeps the enemy team on their, well, not the enemy team, keeps 4 to 31st on the balls of their feet and they're continuing to be a reactionary force to this and which means they're not driving they're doing great reactions they're fighting their best but it's just not enough to kind of bring them bring them forward uh into the victory had they had maybe a bit more altitude uh, a bit more energy it would have been something to see but i was glad to see a massive change in 343's tactics here after seeing how that first fight didn't go so well everything was changed uh from their ingress their tactic of bringing players in in a string remained the same, but they changed up their order. And it's unfortunate we don't have somebody to ask questions to because I'd love to get an idea of what the thoughts were. I think they definitely wanted to use the Tomcats range and missiles to get the Sukhois to have to react at a longer range, which ended up going entirely against their favor as the Sukhois did the same thing to them. Once again, seeing a bit of an altitude lack, you know, at its highest altitude of 30,000 feet, the F-14 can really go higher, and the Sukhois did a great job this match of maintaining good altitude advantage throughout the fight uh, from the start and knowing not only to, uh, to use their altitude, but they changed that energy, that uh, potential energy they had from altitude. Whenever it was needed, they were more than happy to change it into kinetic energy, drop some altitude, gain some speed, and use that to their advantage but then regain that altitude if they could you know when they were engaged and they had to lose altitude that's different but every single time they fired off their missiles and dove down after a little bit of flying in level they'd pop back up and use that energy they gained to get back up to altitude to yeah. maintain a position which is just something that mm. 434th could not do now i've got starry here to talk to so i i might just go oh, have fantastic. a quick chat with him and uh you're welcome to come along too if you like i think i will Hello, Starry. Thank you very much for coming and joining us for a little minute. Yeah, hello. Some fantastic flying from your team. Very, very well done. That was an absolutely great competition. Unfortunately, it didn't go your way today, but I think you guys did great. How are you feeling? Nah, uh, I think uh, uh, it's really hard to say in, in English. Um, you know, we did, uh, we did, uh, uh, we did that as possible as we can. And uh, but uh, we couldn't meet it, but uh, we yeah. had so many things from them. So, mm. actually, uh, for me, uh, it was really a great match and uh, and a uh, little bit happy. Yes, you guys flew beautifully. Is your entire team Japanese? Yeah, today, uh, everyone, every one of us, uh, was Japanese. Some of us is uh, from uh, uh, Pakistan or China, but uh, today, uh, all of us is Japanese. Oh, look, the, the Japanese aviation community must be feeling so proud of all of you guys. Your liveries were looking absolutely beautiful. In that first round and, mm. and in the second one, it feels like there was a distinct plan at the start, but it didn't really happen how you thought it might. Uh, what what do you think could have gone differently? Mm, actually, uh, for today... Uh we don't have uh, so many uh, tactics f tactics against uh, 50 fast today. Um, you know, uh, some of us is just come back to practice. So, um, so some of us uh, was not ready for it. So today uh, we just uh, we just try to uh, learn learn something uh, from 50 fast. Yeah. So we didn't think so well. No, and and flying mostly Western airframes against Sukhois. Yeah must be very difficult uh did they catch you off guard or were you uh were you, did they behave how you expected them to yeah i expected that this situation like uh you know 50 fast is uh, uh really uh skewed the franca pilots you know absolutely so 
yeah, so we know they're gonna use ECM and uh, they're gonna uh, they're gonna use ECM and uh, broke our missile. And uh, yeah, I expected this situation, but uh, actually, uh, I couldn't uh, I couldn't fire. I couldn't fire back against the uh, 51st because they are uh, pushing so hard, and uh, we yeah. most of us uh, is most of us has a uh, uh, no no experience uh, against uh, these uh, uh, professional Franca pilots. Uh, yes, definitely. Yes, uh, and uh, no. Have you got anything you'd like to ask? Well, for now, it's nothing. Uh, but one thing, uh, one thing is. Uh, uh, thanks for today's stream and uh, oh, look. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for you guys a uh, great stream. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Nuff, I can't hear you. Uh, the other the other guy here, Nuff, is uh, is inaudible, uh, and I thought that he was going to ask something too. We'll see if he can figure it out. Um, no, it's been an, a real pleasure watching you guys fight. I felt so sorry uh, in the second round when you guys uh, you guys were low and I could see you just dropping countermeasures and you had. R27 ERs and ETs flying everywhere and it was just a, a difficult fight and uh, I think you got a bit unlucky with some of those AIM-120Cs and Phoenixes. I think that uh, those missiles not connecting was possibly just a bit of bad luck and uh, I think that luck just wasn't on your side today. But thank you very much for flying with us today and I wish you all the best and please pass my congratulations on to the rest of your team. Thank you very much, Starry. I will yeah. catch you later. Yep. Well, um, so one thing I want to I want to tell everyone is uh, we lost today. We lost uh, uh we absolutely lost like a heart, but uh, you know We'll be back. Next time, we're gonna crash cap. We will. We definitely crash, crash 50 fast, and we will take the win. <laughs> I can't wait. I just cannot wait. Good luck. I know you guys have what it takes. Very, very yeah. good luck. Now I know what should I do and uh, what should I practice. So there's well, no, there's no, there's no chance for them next time. That's a that's a big challenge to the to the 51st. Well. I feel like they should be uh they should be taking pleasure in all of that victory but uh they should be on the lookout for what you guys will be bringing next time. Fantastic. Well, good luck to you and uh we'll see if we can find someone from the 51st to have a chat to. Now, uh are there any members of the 51st who would specifically like to hear me now? I can hear you now. What's going on in that I, channel? Uh, my Discord died full-heartedly. I think the, uh, oh, I think no. the 51st boys didn't want me to take part in the interview, and not only were they jamming the fight, they jammed my Discord. And got the ECM in your in your they, Discord. They did. That ECM is just oh so annoying. Yeah, the moment the moment words started being said and just lost everything. Yeah, uh, uh, that was, that's a great mentality they had exiting that fight. You know. From, from this situation saying, you know, eh, we lost, but we're coming back strong next time. I'm really glad to see that out of the uh, out of the 343rd. No, a great attitude. And so cool that it's an entire entirely Japanese team as well. I mean, um, indeed, it, you, you, it just goes to show what a, a worldwide hobby and passion that flight simulation and aerial combat is. Uh, it, there's really just... No matter where you're from, no matter who you're with, there's place and space for all of you. Indeed, it's a fantastic, you know, there's some there's some downsides of every community, but one of the greatest things I think about the DCS community is it's a little bit small in each, you know, it's, we don't, you know, we're not the biggest community between all of our spaces, but because of that, we're so open to welcoming people from, from different areas of the world in that you get these great facilities. There you go. Oh, well, oh hello. Yourself. We've been invited. Oh, well, hello, Rich. How are you? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Um, are we, so, interviews or? Yes, yes. Uh, interviews. Oh, um, I guess you're the one who chooses when we interview now, since you can invade. Yeah, you can, you can, you've come into our space. <laughs> I can indeed, it seems. All right, stand by. I do have a, a co-partner coming up as well. But uh, first things first, yeah, uh, it's a shame I couldn't catch 343, but uh, pleasure as always. It's always a great fight. Uh, fighting uh, 343 in their Hornets, so. 
yeah, it was it was a it was a deadly fight all round. Um, and certainly, I think uh, even though it's a two zero, I don't think uh, I don't think it was necessarily uh, anything other than a very very close fight. Especially in the second round, I feel like there were definitely some points where that could have slipped away from you very easily. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, you know, comes down to the wire. I think in uh, sort of DCS air combat, it's very rarely a two zero actually indicates uh, an absolute you know rollover. You know, it can really come down to just uh, a couple of quick decisions made by individual pilots to win the day. Um, but yeah, I also believe that I've turned them up gone, a bit now, so uh, hopefully they're a bit louder. Absolutely. I've got a question for you, Rich, about the first round when uh -huh. Starry Fox in the F-18 was able to, uh, well, unfortunately for you, remind you that the AMRAM does come from below sometimes, sneak into the side of the fight and, and box you guys in. Was there any indication that uh, Starry Fox was even there? Did your data links pick him up or were you entirely caught off guard? Stand by, co-partner here. Um, so I haven't had the, I haven't checked that views, obviously, uh, that's for after the match is complete. So I don't have the full picture, but, uh, from, uh, what I heard from the rest of the flight when I was, uh, downed is, uh, we had, uh, a guy moving in low and slow. And, uh, I think in the case of me, uh, he was below me and I didn't have an SPO warning, but either way, um, I was busy panning my radar to the right. Uh, and cranking left to uh, keep working uh, what we thought was their main force. But uh, yeah, no surprises there that uh, Starry, uh, the notch, the notch man, uh, notching the AWACS there and coming in low. At least that's my interpretation of events. I haven't had a good chance to have a look over and see exactly what happened. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's uh, Data Link doesn't always give you the full picture. You know, it's always good to, you know, if you think you have all the info, uh, just scan a little lower. You never know what you might find. Good word of advice. Welcome in as well, Stinger. Congratulations. Good to have you here with us. Hi. So, uh, as a point of curiosity, flying the Sukhoi aircraft and making the decision to bring the ECM pods, what, what tactically do you feel that that gives you within engagements like this? Well, it helps us to mask. Yep, um, that's one. From a one, uh, main... one range. The, uh, the main advantage is it removes the loft from the AM120C, which is um, what really gives it uh, its ability to sort of reach out. Um, obviously, you'll notice ERs uh, don't loft, but the reason why, you know, they reach out and hit is just because they got sheer, uh, like, impulse, where, you know, the 120 is a very smart missile, uh, you know, it's using some guidance tricks to, uh, you know, increase its range through a loft. So using ECM, uh, it removes that uh, ability uh, outside of burn through. So uh, as you've probably seen in the match, you know, we like to come in nice and high. So uh, having the ECM on kind of allows us to take advantage of ERs, uh, what they're good at, and kind of negate their advantage of uh, their smarter missile. It has definitely been an education in the, uh, the often underestimated power of the ERs and quite how far they can reach out in, uh, in, in these sorts of dogfights, especially when you're starting from up high and fast, as you guys were entering the second match as soon as you entered the circle, you were about Mach 1.6, and uh, you were just banging away at 40,000 feet, which must have been intimidating. Deciding to fly the SU-33, why the 33 as opposed to the 27s or the J-11s? Is it just personal choice? Uh, mainly aerodynamic, uh, definitely performs better up high where the uh, J11 and Su-27 are more, uh, they work better sort of low down, um, sort of uh, in fuel countermeasures and uh, obviously with the J11, the 77. So uh, that's the decision making behind the uh, 33s uh, as they just uh, thrive up high. That's interesting. No, I, I had, uh, I didn't realize that aerodynamically there was that much benefit to uh, the 33s slightly largestness but you definitely you've shown me you guys were way no, up there a, i think i think one of you peaked out at clarify. forty-seven thousand nautical uh go ahead no sorry just clarify when i say i'm using that kind of as a broad term like yeah it's yeah, just absolutely. uh funny because i know people will uh, be pedantic about it but uh yeah it's just uh just think of it on this way 33 up high 27 j11 down low 
So sorry, continue. Well, speaking about up high and down low, were you guys pleased to see that you guys got a, a negative four degree cold winter match? Did that give you guys any benefits towards your electro optical systems or your desires to get really high up there in the sky? Or do you think it wasn't uh, wasn't too big of a change? So uh, close. Uh, unfortunately, EO is uh, very basic. And of course, you know, everyone wants full fidelity flank release, it seems. So we can get a, a lot better simulation on that. Uh, so yeah, weather doesn't really affect it. Uh, even uh, clouds, which, you know, uh, we're still waiting on ED to implement that. Um, but uh, the negative temperature does give us uh, better performance uh, in engine uh category so it does allow us to push even faster but uh, it's not um a deciding uh factor uh on what we do it's just a nice little uh kick in our direction so to speak i'm just having a look at the flight uh in the second round and for you stinger uh there's an interesting moment when you're curving around down low and you have a f-16 seemingly just appear out of nowhere in front of you did you know that Udati was there, or uh, did he catch you off guard and just flew over your canopy and you went, oh no. Is that towards the end of the match, or...? Yeah, the end of the second round. Yeah, in the very end, yeah, I did see him on a data link. Uh, I, I saw contacts on data link, and then I knew I, I was merged, and I think I went vertical, and fired a missile. And then it was all over. I actually have to see tech views to see exactly what happened. But yeah, I knew someone was there. It just um, happened really quickly. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, true, true. Well, uh, any anything, any behavior from uh, the 343rd that caught you guys off guard? Any any tense moments where you thought, oh, we might have made a mistake here? I know there were some very close calls with... Uh, with some Phoenixes and, and AM120Cs, one of which I think came within 10 feet of hitting one of you guys. Uh, did it feel like you were in control the whole time? Um, again, I haven't looked at the tap view, so I can't be, you know, that's where we kind of realized what was going on. But uh, yeah, you know, 343, they're working, uh, you know, the sort of information warfare of it all, you know, notching. Uh, Obviously, the flanker's radar is pretty poor at uh, detecting uh, notching targets as well as low and, you know, uh, hiding from the AWACS. And uh, I guess that caught us off uh, by surprise, you know, but that's kind of what happens every time you fight a team round one. You kind of get a feel for what they're doing and then, you know, you adapt after. Uh, and apart from that, yeah, uh, that round two, uh, like I said at the beginning, it's just one of those, uh, the, the, the uh, finale, let's say, where, you know, it very much comes down to, uh, obviously, you know, the teamwork, but, uh, you know, some snap decision making by uh, individual pilots can really uh, win the day clean. Um, but uh, yeah, apart from that, you know, uh, just uh, great fights from uh, free for free as always. And you've seen some of the teams do battle thus far and you've seen some of the people you're likely to go up against in the future how confident are you feeling about potentially going all the way hard to tell um we kind of just take a, a mantra of just take it one match at a time you know just keep fighting keep flying do what we do uh we don't really um like what's the word like we don't have any like uh 200 uh, page documents on how to beat said team we kind of, you know, we have our we have our strategies, we have our counters, count, you know, counters to counters. Uh, you know, like I say, round one, we kind of see what they're up to and then adjust our own plan on that. Uh, but yeah, as always, aim for the stars, you know. Uh, we absolutely want to, uh, you know, get there on, on the final with flankers, you know, and show, uh, you know, it's uh, more than it uh, looks uh, to be, you know, in sort of a public setting. Well, as a flanker myself, I can certainly get behind the thought of having a, Having some of the brothers in uh, in the final rounds, and it's great to see uh, an oft underestimated aircraft be put through its paces. And yes, Eagle Dynamics, if you are listening, full fidelity flanker would be great, please, and thank you. Uh, well, I might just talk to uh, Nuff for a little bit, and then we'll wind up. Uh, it's not quite time for Tiger to start the second match of the day, so we'll probably just close up shop here. But well done to you guys. Congratulations on the win. And uh, I certainly look forward to seeing where you'll go next. 
Absolutely. And uh, just before uh, we sign off uh, here, uh, <laughs> for FIFA 3, uh, Starry Fox, till next time. And uh, I would just like to uh, just a personal thank you for me uh, as well for, for, uh, to FIFA 3 for, uh, for the good flight, uh, fights and flights. And of course, uh, you lovely flo- uh, folks streaming uh, live here and obviously sponsors. And uh, last but uh, definitely not least, uh, thank you to SPQR and the really professional server team uh, providing servers for uh, SATAC this year. Yes, oh, look, it, from, I can speak for myself and I can say it's a pleasure. And I'm sure Absolutely. everyone else would agree. Absolutely, same here. It's an absolute pleasure. All right, I'll leave you guys you know, uh, to do your thing. And uh, Just yep. before you go, 343 yep, had some words for you guys at 51st. They said they lost 2-0, uh, but they're coming for you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let them come. Uh, we'll, we'll also come running. Head they on. found themselves <laughs> a bit more <laughs> educated, and they're ready to, ready to take you on next time. All right, but, uh, yep, let's, uh, let's do Mac 1.6 versus Mac 1.6. I think that would be a nice fight, though. I think, unfortunately, <laughs> it would, uh, yeah. Ah, well, don't expect. already ran out of fuel. <laughs> Take it easy. All right, thanks, guys. Ah, oh, well, Nuff, I'm sorry that your match didn't go through today. Have you got another one lined up? I have one tomorrow. I'll be, I'll oh, be doing the, uh, tomorrow's match. The That's a great question. Is it the early morning match or not? I should know this. As it's, uh, it's where I have to be. I believe it is the second match of the day, the 1800 Zulu. Uh... But I'm not sure all of a sudden. Uh, I wasn't prepared. I didn't study, which is never good. Oh, look, it's uh, flown by the seat of your pants in every sense, at least. That's how I do it. So uh, we'll, definitely, uh, we'll definitely keep calling it as we see it. But uh, thank you very much for joining in for a little bit today. Of course, thank you for having me on such short notice. Uh, I certainly appreciated it. Otherwise, I would have been sitting around just watching. So it was good to be able to give uh, some of my thoughts during the TACU stage. Absolutely. Thank you for helping out. I might just sign off and uh, prep everyone for the next match. Fantastic. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Well, that's some good fighting and flying. Now, the next match of the day is due to begin in about 40 minutes. It'll be streamed on 104th Tiger's channel, which you can find in the chat. I think that we'll just end this stream. We won't necessarily raid anyone because a lot of the viewers here will be here specifically for SATAC. So if you want to know when the next SATAC matches are coming up, you definitely want to go check out Tiger's stream. Big thank you to everyone who came along and helped out during this stream. Thank you to all of the competitors and everyone for having me. Thank you for your patience with a few technical issues through the middle, but it wouldn't be DCS without them. So I will sign off for you guys. Don't forget that if you like me and my content, good places to get more of it are on my Discord and to follow me on Twitter. I might even stream a little bit later today and do a little bit of my own content. But if you want to follow me and see the flanker, I always spend a bit of time playing DCS and a variety of other predominantly flight simulation games. But who knows? Who knows what we could have coming up in the future? And... Uh, Please enjoy yourselves. I will sign up for my next SATAC match. Hopefully they'll have me back again. I probably haven't burned this bridge all the way just yet. Uh, but we will see what happens. Thanks, guys. And please take good care of yourselves. <laughs> Till next time.